thank you all for being there. We have, we have the pleasure, the pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Sion Barakaria from uh, Nottingham University to uh, give a talk for the seventh session of the Meta Metaphysics and Science Seminar. Hmm? Oh, yeah, sorry. No, uh, so, he will give us a talk today about uh, global expressivism and second order nihilism. So, thank you, uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. <coughs> Great pleasure. So, what am I going to do today is, I've been thinking about global expressivism for quite a while, trying to formulate how to, how to formulate it and its metaphysical implications. So that's what I want to talk about. I'm, I will try and keep the... Um, sorry, I've got to get this. Try your space bar and see if that... Not even that. <clears throat> that's really weird. Sorry, we have a technical problem. Okay, so here's my talk outline. So, uh, first I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to try and get through this as quickly as possible. How long can we maybe interject at any moment you want to interject? I don't want to go on too long, but this material might. And you have, you have yeah, up to an hour. Yeah, yeah, okay, hour, so. so I'm going to talk about ontology to begin with as a way of investigating reality. And I'm going to indicate why I don't like it. I think there's something wrong with the whole ontological orientation. So I'm really looking for a sort of beyond ontology way of thinking about reality. And to get to that point, I'm going to have to tell you what I think the origin of ontological thinking is. So I'm going to do a bit of reconstruction of what's motivating it, what's informing it, what, what's under the skin, what is under the, the bonnet, as we say in Australian English. What kind of engine is driving your ontology car? And why do you do what you do? And I'm going to say it's got to do with certain views about, unsurprisingly, how thought relates to the world. So there's underlying ideas about, or a picture about, how thought relates to the world. And th this relates to this thing called the mirror, mirror view of language, and a kind of way of thinking about the mind and reality, which is a sort of separation between mind and reality. So I'm going to talk about that. And that's going to help us see what we have to tweak, get rid of, abandon, if we want to get rid of ontology. That's, that's what happens here. Then I'm going to look at a false dawn, a sort of the wrong way to do it from my point of view. And that's more or less what I would call an internalist constructivist approach. So the metaphor is, so here, sort of ontology is broadly speaking the idea of of a reality in itself that we investigate. We want to, and, and that's inherently problematic, I'm going to suggest. And the way out of that is to say, well, let's deny this idea of reality in itself. And we think rather that in some sense the mind constructs reality, to put it in somewhat crude terms. And you can see maybe some of that in Kant. <coughs> transcendental idealism and in later views like Carnap and probably also in Buddhist philosophy in various forms but we can't cover the whole terrain and I'm going to indicate why I don't, I don't think this is the way out it's not going to be where I don't want to be a constructivist rather there's going to be another way which I hope to get onto as soon as possible which is this We've got to change our view about how we think about language. And the way to do that is something called global expressivism, which I'm going to talk about. And it's associated with this, call it non-mirror way of thinking about language. And I'll sketch that out and then show that it has 
metaphysical implication, or sort of negative metaphysical implication. The view of reality that you should accept if you accept this view about the nature of language and thought and its relation to the world is that you should accept second-order nihilism. And second-order nihilism, I always like to play to the camera in some way, but <laughs> I don't know, don't know who I'm talking to, but that's fine. Second-order nihilism is, well, what is it? I'm going to briefly say what it is. Um, so first-order nihilism, first-order nihilism is like this. I'm doing, I'm in the metaphysics room, and I'm going, what, what is this material thing, this, this plastic water-containing vessel? And uh, I theorize about its composition and makeup and so forth. And at some point I do this, I don't think this exists. Why? Oh, well, because, for example, problem of special composition. Is everyone familiar with that sort of problem? You go, I don't know what what uh, ultimately the composition relation is, so I can't think that this really exists, right? It's, it's conditions for objecthood are not present, so it doesn't exist. That's a first order nihilism. In other words, ordinary chairs, tables, human bodies, etc. don't exist despite appearances. First order nihilism. That's what, I'm not interested in that view. I think that's deluded. The view I think is right is the following. Yeah, this thing exists, but it has no metaphysical nature. There is nothing which ultimately constitutes it. There is no real definition of what material things are. They exist happily without having any, call it, metaphysical nature. In other words, you're a nihilist about the very thing that metaphysicians are trying to, as it were, describe when they do metaphysics. Second order nihilism. Uh, and that's what I want to get to. So there's the structure of the talk. Uh, so very quickly, I'm going to, well, let's see if I can actually progress this thing. Let's see. The, so let's get to part one, which is more or less... Uh, ooh. Come on. Oh, I see. It's just thinking. It's oh. thinking. Try. And it just thinks. It's there. Yeah, it's a. That's what try that. It's try, use the use yeah use the left hand button, but you may have to be clicking it more than once. For some reason, oh, voila. Taking multiple clicks. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so very quickly, here's the view which I'd like to get to in the end. It's called almost pragmatism, and it's roughly something like this. We talk about all sorts of things with all sorts of discourse in literature, in ethics, in the sciences, etc. And we talk about, we quantify over things like atoms, electrons, chairs, trees, animals, moral facts, etc., etc., mythological beings, you name it. We talk about all this stuff in various discourses. Um, we judge that some of these things exist, some are real, we say, like, I don't know, atoms are real, and we judge that others are not real. We don't think witches are real, or we don't think Pegasus the flying horse is real. Good, we do that. Here's the thought. There is no theory of the ultimate nature of things or of reality that should inform these judgments about what's real or not real. In other words, we think that witches don't exist. Why? Well, because, you know, we realize that there is no spell casting going on, etc. That the witches that we thought were witches are just women who were herbalists, etc., etc. Um, so there's all sorts of good reasoning to say that witches don't exist and Pegasus doesn't exist, etc. But none of that should have anything to do with a theory about the nature of reality. Right. So in other words, I'm an almost pragmatist 
um, in the following sense, that I think clearly we make these distinctions between what's real and what's not real, and that's fine, that should continue to go on, but it shouldn't be on the basis of any theory of what the nature of reality is. In other words, a theory of existence or a theory of reality. Right? That's what I'm against. So that's what I want to talk about. That's what ontology is. Ontology is a theory of reality. Okay, so a theory of reality, what is that? So in other words, the picture of ontology typically is this. The ontologist is a person who will... You, you'll go to the ontologist with all your opinions about what is the case and what is not, and how you talk. You know, you like to do science or you like to do mathematics, so you seem to be talking about numbers or atoms, etc., etc. And you go to the ontologist and the ontologist will say to you, ah, those things exist, let's say the atoms, that's okay, but those things, the numbers, they don't exist. And you ask why, and the ontologist will tell you, well, according to my theory of the nature of reality, numbers can't possibly be things that exist. And they will give you their theory about the nature of reality. Okay, that's the job of ontologists. And here's my claim. That's not a job we should take seriously at all. We should get rid of that job description. Um, that's what I want to get rid of. Uh, what is ontology? Well, here's my rough take on it. It's the search for the ultimate reality of things. What reality consists in, consists in its constitution, its makeup. In other words, its real definition. That's what ontology is doing. As Quine says in various places, no entity without identity. Whenever you talk about things, about entities, etc., you've got to find the identity of those things. You need to formulate a kind of definition of what they are before you can say they really exist. And you will, you're allowed to quantify them. Um, so, if you ask, what is this thing called ontology, like a science of being qua being, it is nothing else than the search for real definitions or uh, ultimate analyses of being or reality more generally. So, and, and the principle that guides it is the following. If we quantify over x, then x must have a real definition uh, an ultimate nature as to what it is. Nominal definitions are things where you just define the meanings of words. Real definitions are where you go and define the nature of things. Um, so that's the principle I call real. It's not the principle of sufficient reason. Uh, that's another principle, but we could talk about that. The same. It's not the same principle. Okay, let's see if I can get to the next slide. I need a principle of progression from you. Okay. Um. Oh, now I've got to go. Oh, now you've got to go back. Ah, good. So, what are the sorts of questions? So here's sort of we could spend quite a bit of time on this, I do that would be a disaster. Uh, what what are the sorts of questions? What what's a key question that guides ontological thinking. It's questions like this. What, so you take some, something like properties. You know, we seem to talk about properties. And you go, here's the ontologist. What is a property? What is a property ultimately? What does being a property consist in? Right? What constitutes being a property, etc.? It's these questions that guide Ontology. It's not so much what exists, and it's not really what grounds what. It's rather a question of real definition. What does this thing consist in? What is it ultimately? So we ask, what is it to be a property? And we can come up with theories or answers. We say, well, properties are ultimately what? Sets or functions or <coughs> tropes or maybe they're even primitive, metaphysically primitive. That is an answer as well. Right, so 
These are the sorts of things that we do when we do ontology. We come up with answers to these questions. I don't know, it's like a qu'est-ce que c'est que ça question. Whatever. What is it? What does it consist in? Similarly, with what is a material thing, right? People sit around the ontology classroom and say, well, what are material things like uh, plastic bottles? And you can give answers like, well, they're ultimately bundles of properties or primitive substances or chunks of space time, etc., etc., etc. And they involve, let's say, a mode of composition in, the, in some cases, and so on. And then you have to define what those things are. You have to answer, well, what is space time? Right? Those questions continue. Or, what is causation? I've uh, been in causation class where we sit down and we analyze causation. Is it constant conjunction? Is it counterfactual dependency? Is it primitive necessitation? Etc. Right? They, these are the questions that guide ontology, and they are attempts to provide real definitions. And here's the thing if you can't provide a satisfying definition of something, it doesn't exist. You can't allow it into your ontology in the sense of the things that you think are things that exist according to you. So, here we go again. Ha. Uh, just very quickly, so as not to spend too much time on this, What's real definition? I think it's the following. There are identity claims. So here's my claim. All ontological theories, all theories about, call it, an ultimate theory of reality, is going to comprise a whole bunch of statements like this with variations. You can do it with necessary and sufficient conditions for things and so forth. Don't worry about those variations. But at the heart of it, it's going to be things like, O is ultimately X. And what are those statements? Well, they're statements that are identities, but they're not just identities because identity is symmetric. Okay, these are asymmet have an asymmetric component, and it's the following: O's phenomenal features or surface features, right? Manifest features are explained by O's deep features, these inner features. Of o. So if I if I'm Worried about numbers, and I said, well, what are numbers? Numbers are X's, numbers are sets, certain kinds of sets. So sets are going to be used to explain the features of the manifest features of natural numbers, for example, and so on. So the picture that captures it, that everything we talk about is going to have this sort of structure, it's going to have the deep features <clears throat> and the phenomenal or relatively surface features, and it's going to have a kind of explanatory structure to it. You could say, if you believe this, that water is H2O, right? So you've got the water, <coughs> phenomenal features of water, you've got the composed of H2O nature, and that explains the manifest features. It's the source or origin of the manifest features. Okay. <clears throat> and that X could be intrinsic, could be extrinsic. You can give structures to kinds of numbers, you can give intrinsic views of numbers as certain kinds of sets, etc. <coughs> so that's it. <coughs> uh, come on, come, come. Oh, see, I go too far. <laughs> ah! Is that my next slide? I suppose it is. Yeah, it is my next slide. So, so um, God. Maybe we should switch computer. We can try and bring money more. Up to you. Yeah, we would ah, it depends. Well, if you're comfortable to continue, no problem. But Wait, you're going to have embarrassing breaks. But if you want to change computer, we can provide another one. Yeah, how about I get, I'll get rid to the end of this section and then maybe we could... As you wish. As yeah. you wish. Yeah, it might go a bit more smoothly. As you wish. Zap in between. Okay, so... 
If you've got this sort of basic picture of ontology, it's this attempt to find the real definition of reality. Hi there, you just dropped in. Ontology is this attempt to find a real definition, the ultimate nature of reality, and that's not too controversial. Then here are your choices. You can say that there are going to be metaphysical primitives, so that's called foundationalism, and that's how people typically talk about it. Yeah, there's going to be some bunch of ultimate primitives through which we explain everything, the building blocks of reality. Maybe there are many such primitives, or maybe there's one, in some sense, if you're a prime, uh, priority monist or something like that. That's one way of doing it. The other, and this is often thought of as not a good idea, there will be infinite descent. That is, there will be no, as it were, primitives at any level. There's a sort of infinite or fractal-like constitution of reality. It will go on forever. Or another is a looping, and this is often called coherentism, where your attempt to, as we define what a chair is ultimately, loops around, you get down to, let's say, properties and bundling, but then you're led back through a chain of dependency back to a chair. <coughs> you can look at that in terms of grounding, sorry, here's a little footnote, or you can look at it in terms of real definition. I think real definition is the way to think about it, that's a little footnote there. There's a distinction of thinking about this in terms of grounding. A lot of people talking about that at the moment. Or real definition, which I think is where the action is. But there are the sort of options, structurally speaking, for where you can, you can go in a <clears throat> ontological theory. Hang on. Let's do it. <laughs> ah, good. So, here's the thing. Ontology is very hard to do. Okay. And there are all sorts of problems that arise. First off, note, we apply Occam's razor to reality, right? When we do ontology. I'm surrounded by people that act nodding. We're always applying, ah, I've got fewer things in my... Uh, Fewer sort of bits of reality in my, my world, or fewer kinds of realities in my world, or uh, I've got <clears throat> fewer ideological primitives in my, my worldview versus yours. And that's meant to be a way of arguing why one view is better than another. Why are you applying Occam's razor to re questions of reality, right? It's because you've got an explanatory project on board, and that explanatory project is real definition of things. Uh, we go on about dubious entities. Quine, right, Quine's just meant to be concerned with existence, but he's very sort of censorious about dubious entities. He doesn't like meanings, for example. Why doesn't he like meanings? Because you can't define them. Think of two dogmas of empiricism. Uh, we don't like metaphysical, du we don't like uh, du uh, dualities because they become dualisms. I'm not, I won't go through each one, but we've got problems of unity, we've got the sort of threat of reductionism, we've got knowledge problems because we give ontological theories about what knowledge is, so how do we explain our knowledge of mathematical entities, etc, etc. <clears throat> that's all a big pain, that's, that's part of the struggles of ontology. Ways out, how do we get out of it? Well, First order nihilism is one way that people, in trying to get unified pictures of the real definition of reality, they say, well, I'm going to be a fictionalist about numbers or about chairs or about people or about moral facts or you name it. <clears throat> That's called first, first order nihilism is frequently what people do in response to ontological problems. And there are other <coughs> kinds of ways out, deflationism and so forth. Okay, so my, here we go. My, my question is, is there any way out of it? Because some people look at ontology and go, well, you can frolic in this wonderful field or ocean of questions and get caught up with all sorts of delicate distinctions and so forth, it's great. Or you might, other reactions are, it's just going to end in dead ends. <coughs> you know, there's something 
wrong here. <clears throat> Could we have a non-ontological view of reality? That's the question. Um, and the answer to do that is, <clears throat> well, we've got to get rid of real, this principle of real. Real is the principle, the background principle that says, look, if I quantify over it, you've got to tell me what it is. <laughs> What the hell are you quantifying over? Give me an account of its nature. Right? Give me a, a logos, an account, what it is, ultimately. Define it. Otherwise, what is it? <laughs> right? You know, it's that principle that's saying, unless you can give me a proper ultimate identity of what it is, you have nothing that you should be talking about. Right? It's that principle, <clears throat> which I call real, we've got to get rid of it. Right? It's a, call it explanatory view of reality. We've got to get rid of that principle if we want to get rid of ontology, because it's the central assumption of ontological thinking, according to this text. So, and my answer, sorry, this is, what I, this is where I want to get to, is this. Yeah, it's completely wrong. Sorry, as a matter of fact, maybe even necessarily, it's completely wrong. That principle, real, to be quantified over, you've got to have a real definition, an account of what you are. You've got to shape up and go, yes, sir, give me an account of what you are, right? That principle couldn't be more wrong. In fact, all things are without ultimate nature. All things are without real definition. They can't possibly have real definitions. There's something delusional about the ontological orientation. That's second order nihilism. So second order nihilism is things are real and exist according to our best, you know, according to maths, right? The reals exist, or according to physics, hey, there are atoms out there, etc. According to our moral understanding of the world, there are moral facts. Um, but there's no ultimate nature to any of those things. So you don't go to the ontologist and say, ontologist. Am I allowed to quantify over these things, right? Give me your theory or your criterion of existence, right? There is no such thing. So non-real is the principle I like. Instead of real, I'm non-real. And that says, for all O, it's false that O is ultimately X. For whatever X you like. So take properties. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> I'm going to jump to my next quantum leap. See, it's a bit like Bohr Adam. It'll only do certain kinds of jumps. <laughs> or you've got to hit it with the right amount of quantum of energy for it to... Okay. <clears throat> um, what are properties? Sorry, I'm just too loud. I'm used to... I lectured to like 100 people in the class. <laughs> sort of jump around like that. <clears throat> Sorry. This is more chamber music intimate. So. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> what are properties? What are properties, right? I know people writing theses on what properties are. Well, they're not sets. They're not functions. This is, this is the negative. This is the, sec, this is the second order nihilism view. They're not tropes. They're not universals. They're not even primitive. Like simply, metaphysically simple things. So what are they? Well, they have no ultimate nature. Relax. Uh, is the world ultimately physical or mental or a dualism of physical or mental? You know, should we be panpsychists? Should we be physicalists? Should we be Cartesian dualists or neutral monist, double aspect, whatever? Uh, well, none of them. The world doesn't have an ultimate nature. It's not ultimately physical. It's not ultimately mental, etc. That might seem like giving up. No, I want to get to this through hard work, as it were. But that's the view. Is the world ultimately a plurality or a single thing? So at the moment, people are arguing about priority monism versus priority pluralism, right? Different views about reality. And the answer is, what is the world ultimately? Well, neither. It has no ultimate nature. It's got, it's got physical characteristics, right? So in other words, yes, there are chairs, tables, people, quarks, uh, physical fields, etc. Yeah, cool. Yeah, but is there an ultimate real definition of all of that? Packaging it all into one total reality, which is the ultimate reality? No. But it doesn't mean it's just, as Hume would say, 
separate things loosely bundled with each other, somehow with these contingent relations with, it, with, with each other. It's not that either, because that's another view about what ultimate reality is. Strange. OK. Um, oh. Let's get there. Let's get there. <laughs> We're going to get there. <clears throat> ah. So, OK, so second order nihilism, which I hope to put forward place before you, it's not like a metaphysical foundation, it's not one of these ontological views, it's not like infinitism or coherentism, etc. But it's not the standard reaction to the metaphysical realist position. It's not constructivism. Because the constructivist, people like Kant, Carnap, Putnam to some degree, and others, they still want to define reality in some general sense. They, they'll say, Everything we talk about is a construction. Right? Everything we talk about is a kind of simulation in a, in a conceptual map-like system or something like that. Well, everything is uh, reality, the empirical world is somehow made up of the noumenal world and the noumenal mind getting together to make up, which is what the transcendental idealist says. Or the ontological deflationist says, <clears throat> oh, ontology is easy, right? To exist is just to satisfy predicates. No. <laughs> I think that's too far. That's an ontological view. It's going to be problematic. That's Amy Thompson's view. <clears throat> no. Second order nihilism. No questions about the nature of things in general play any role in judgments about what's real. There simply isn't any ontology. <clears throat> I know it sounds. Uh, a bit crankish or something. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I think that would, uh, be, uh, it would, for some mentalities or some uh, forms of taste, that they would like that idea. Others would think it's got to be wrong. Okay, so uh, very quickly, without so that's end of part one. Um, we could try changing the computer at this point, or it might just go a bit. Five minutes, or please yeah. continue. Yeah, and, like, I'll yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just talk. Yeah, we're, sorry, we've got a pit stop here. We're going to change the computer. <clears throat> Maybe you can ask a question. Then we'll, if someone asks a question, whatever. The first pass. Just a last question so far. Just to sum it up so far, <clears throat> I know this is fairly meta metaphysical, meta, <clears throat> it's going to be meta semantic as well. But <clears throat> sort of the core idea is ontology is a discipline, it's the, the science of being qua being, that seeks, I claim, <clears throat> I don't think hugely controversially. I think other people would claim this. <clears throat> An ultimate definition of reality. And what drives it, and I think it's not implausible, it's quite intuitive in some sense, are these questions where we say, what is that ultimately that you're talking about? So when we're in, I grew up, <laughs> in the philosophy tradition, analytic I suppose, where we ask questions like the following. What is a proposition? No, when you do semantics, you sit around and you say, at some point you can say, what's a proposition? As a metaphysical question, that question is, what, what does a thought that can be true or false, that can be an object of belief, let's say, that can be asserted, Etc. What does it consist in? And you can offer theories like, oh, it's a set of possible worlds, or it's a Phrygian sense, zin. It's. Uh, can I borrow your key when, yeah. while you're talking? Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's one that says Luva. And people write. You know, people offer their theories, 
about what propositions ultimately are. Um, that's an ontological mode of investigation. Take knowledge, right? People say, well, that's epistemology when you think about knowledge. Well, yeah, but it's metaphysical thinking applied to certain kinds of mental states or certain kinds of... of <clears throat> Should be in the, this one? Yeah. Or should we? 11. Should have brought my net. Do I? Yeah, we'll switch. First teaching first year impulse. So. <clears throat> uh, yeah, tech knowledge. People say, yeah, well, give me an analysis, right? So analy analytic philosophy discovered the idea of well, rediscovered the idea of analysis. Um, not to um, Ah, great. Oh, look at that. It's so snappy. That's wow. snappy. <laughs> someone, someone should mass produce this. <laughs> you make a lot of money if you did that. Yeah. Um, anyway, I take knowledge. You go, yeah, what is knowledge? You offer necessary and sufficient conditions for it, right? And that's say knowledge is ultimately justified true belief or safe. What is it? Uh, counterfactually safe belief. Or uh, it's primitive is another option. It's ontological thinking. Uh, in other words, you, you offer theoretical identities about things in order to, to capture <coughs> our intuitions about them. So we've got intuitions about knowledge, so we go, I want to sort of provide this <coughs> theoretical identification of knowledge from which the intuitive features will then be explained. Okay. <coughs> That project, which I think permeates a lot of how we think, is, I, was, I, I would argue, is an ontological, sorry, is a cognitive illusion. It's based on a cognitive illusion about reality, is the claim. <clears throat> if I had more time and I'd try to write a popular book, which I probably never will do, I'd call it the, the, the metaphysics delusion or something like that. Sorry, just to try and sell of course, it wouldn't sell. Anyway, uh, so very quickly, without, I don't want to drag us through too much of this. Um, the question is, here's the thought, here's the claim. We really are inclined, and I too, I'm, I'm a metaphysician, this is a metaphysician's anonymous meeting, right? It's like alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous. Sorry, I don't want to make jokes about addiction. But it's kind of like <coughs> addiction where you go, well, oh, I really get it. I really get into metaphysics. I was there busily. I can really understand wanting to analyze uh, things in this way. And that we should, only, we should only allow quantification over things that we can so analyze. <clears throat> Why am I being driven? What are the mechanisms that drive me to want to do that? What, what's the theoretical... Is there, is there a presuppositions behind it that drive that tendency to want to think that way. <clears throat> and I think there is. So there's a kind of genealogy of metaphysics, and here's a, sort of the basic idea, and um, I'm going to, so I don't, I'm going to sort of jump over this a bit. Uh, I think we've got, here's the basic idea. We've got this idea of mind-world separation. I'm, I probably won't go through the slides to do this. I'll just, in fact, I'll just jump along here. Here, here, here we go. <clears throat> Here's the intuitive idea. 
There's my mind here somehow. And there's reality out there, the external world. So when, when philosophers do metaphysics, they often use the term, they say, oh, the external world. We're concerned with the external world, the world out there, the world of things in itself, or things in themselves. Uh, chose en soi. Yes. <laughs> right. right. You think, ah, the things out there in themselves, etc. So implicit in that thinking is this idea, oh, mind is here, my mind, my cogitations, my thought, the world is out there. <clears throat> and once you think in those terms, very roughly, you go, yeah, mind is out there, things are out there. Right? Things can live happily without language, without being named, etc. Okay? The, the, the mind is the naming. Come, not, my, mind brings names into the world. How do you get the names to hook onto or be to hook onto the things? if there's the separation? And the answer is, oh, causation. Very roughly. In other words, causation links things to the mind. <clears throat> and that's, in effect, the causal theory of perception and the causal theory of reference. So, <clears throat> and that's the idea that mind is functioning like a mirror. So, <clears throat> basically, a mirror, if the, if the banana is, mir is being mirrored in the mirror, is a reflection in the mirror of the banana. Here's the thought. The image of the banana not only resembles the banana, but is also caused by the banana. In other words, the banana out there causes its own image in the mirror. <clears throat> okay, the mirror view about the mind is the mind's like that. So this isn't, as Richard Rorty would say, the mirror view is not just that there is representation. It's rather the following idea. It's more subtle. My representations right, are about things. And the things that my representations are about, more or less, roughly speaking, cause these representations that I have. <clears throat> In the simplest cases, for the simplest. I mean, there's the descriptive theory of reference. Don't worry about that. But <clears throat> so that's the. In the case of perception, that's the causal theory of perception. Right. I've got a represent. I'm, in other words, I see a room, the room, I've got a representation of a room, and this perception is really going on because the room itself is causing this representation of the room. Causal theory of reference, of, of perception. <clears throat> uh, causal theory of reference says something like this a linguistic expression or concept, this is sort of more or less Putnam used by a certain agent can refer to a particular kind, particular or a kind, only if that agent is causally connected to that particular or kind, or to other particulars and kinds that could be used to descriptively refer to or represent the relevant particular or kind. In other words, in the end, your, call it mental representations, have to be causally glued onto bits of the world, the domain, things in the domain. So there's an explanatory view about perception and reference. <clears throat> okay. I call that the mirror view. It's fairly straightforward. So here's the claim. <clears throat> uh, this idea of separation, in some sense, mind's here, the world's out there, the external world, in order to, as it were, bridge the gap between mind and world, we bring a causation. That's the causal theory of perception and causal theory of reference. <laughs> okay, that's the mirror view. My mind works like a mirror. Okay, that view, my mind works like a mirror, is deeply connected to the principle real that says all things have an ultimate nature, a real definition. If you're thinking implicitly that your mind is, <coughs> things are out there in the external world, so those things out there have to cause my mental representations, etc. Right? My mind functions like a mirror. I'm also going to think that the world has a real definition. That everything I refer to or quantify over has a real definition. So, that's the next bit. Why is that? Why? So, what I want to do now, very quickly, is explain Mirror, the principal mirror, my mind functions like a mirror, causal theory of reference and perception, implies real, given 
uncontroversial background ideas. And if I accept real, I should accept mirror. In other words, they're a package. It's a, it's a conceptual package. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say we shouldn't accept this idea of external world, right? And thus we shouldn't accept mirror, and so we shouldn't accept real. That's, that's where I'm going to get to. Sorry, does everyone, everyone get that? I'm, genealogically, I'm going to do a switcheroo on the genealogy and say, look, <coughs> you don't want to accept mirror, so you don't, shouldn't accept real, okay? And there's reasons why you don't want to accept mirror. We'll, they're more or less the huge problems we have with meta-semantics at the moment. But, okay, so I want a non-mirror view of language that will give us a non-real view of reality. Okay, uh, here's very quickly, it's a bit of a pain to get through this. I certainly, I've scratched my head about it <clears throat> quite a bit. Hope people are still there in... <clears throat> Sorry, should have warmed up my voice. <clears throat> so, if you... So here's from mirror to real. Here's the rough idea. One could spend time on it, but... If any thought about a thing O is present... So, any thought about a thing O in any thought about a thing, O is presented to thought as a unity, as a sort of... What, what we know about every object is this. It's, it's a one thing. It's got many characteristics, and they're bound together as one thing. Think of anything. Think of number two. Think of whatever. Think of a property. A property is one thing, and it's got characteristics. It's like... It's a monadic property, and it's natural or not natural, etc., etc. It's always a thing with characteristics. It's a very, very, very general thing to say, right? So everything in thought is presented like that. And it's necessary to. You couldn't possibly have a thing without characteristics. Even a so-called substratum has characteristics, namely can instantiate properties or something like that. So, right, so everything is like that. <clears throat> Given mirror, the perceived necessity of those property unity. Everything has a property unity necessarily. It's got properties and it's a one. <clears throat> Must be caused by O itself, the thing ultimately out there that's causing your knowledge, perceptions and representations of it. Otherwise, how would this perception or reference be a sort of somehow a knowing of that thing out there that you're actually referring to? The number two or the, the person you just saw, etc., etc. So O must have a real definition, a deeper being X, through which its property unity is grounded. Something in it securing this necessity. It's got to be in that thing. In other words, you inherit that property unity of everything that you think about from the thing itself. So that thing must, as it were, secure this necessity. It must have a real definition about what it is. <coughs> kind of a, like an essence of what it is. So that means mirror gives you real claim. Um, I won't go through the, another way. There are several ways you can think about this. Here is real to mirror. <clears throat> You're going, you judge that O is ultimately X. You know, numbers, uh, natural numbers, are ultimately sets. That's what they are. They're sets. Ah, right. Um, <clears throat> Leave aside the, Nas the Nasserists worry about many ways of doing set theory for numbers. Forget it. <clears throat> okay. Ah, okay. So O is ultimately X. So that means the features of O are explained by X. Yeah? Explanatory notion of reality or reference, etc. These features include all your intuitions about X. Because that's part of, as it were, X's appearance. So these should be ultimately explained by Sorry, all your, include all your intuitions about O. Sorry, that should be O. <clears throat> Sorry. They should. So, X must be explanatory, the explanatory source for O's features, including these, as it were, intuitive 
judgments you make about O, oh, about the sets. So if, I'm, if I really say numbers are sets, yeah, the numbers can explain the manifest features. Sorry, the sets can explain the manifest features of the numbers, including all my intuitions about numbers. Like the fact that I can, the successor of any, any natural number, positive natural number, will be a positive natural number, etc., etc., must be explained by <coughs> the thing itself. So, mirror must hold. In other words, I'm in, sort of inheriting the knowledge of the, the, all my intuitions come from the thing out there, which is ultimately causing, the, there must be it out there causing my intuitions. Mirror must hold. I probably garbled that a bit, but that was my attempt to roughly get the idea. So, <coughs> here's the thought. Mirror goes with real, real goes with mirror. They're two sides of the same idea. And that goes with the idea that when we think about reality, we always place our mind in relation to reality. You can't just say, well, I'm going to talk about reality. You've got to, insofar as you want to talk about reality as something, reality in itself, etc., the external world, you've brought in your mind is a way of characterizing this very general feature of reality. And the mirror, this mirror real nexus here is just, as it were, pointing out that if, given that you think that things ultimately have to cause your representations and thus cause your intuitions about those things, right, the things out there have to, as it were, organize themselves, you might say. They must have real definitions to them. Which, so the in other words, since your intuitions have to be explained about from the things themselves, those things too must have an explanatory structure to them. That's sort of the basic idea. <clears throat> so, if we reject real, we must reject mirror, and if we reject mirror, we have to reject real. So in other words, if you could reject these principles. question is, would we want to reject the causal theory of reference or the explanatory theory of reference, etc., etc. And I think here's, here's the problem. We have no idea how it actually works. There's no good causal theory of reference out there at the moment. I don't know any of you. So think about Wittgenstein's problem of you know, what constitutes the fact that my mind grasps a certain function, like the <clears throat> extension of the predicate red, for example, or the, or the plus. Has anyone read uh, Kripke's Wittgenstein and Private Language sort of considerations? Yeah, there's no good theory about what constitutes the mind's grasp of semantic entities like extensions and so forth. And that means the call it mirror view of language is quite problematic <clears throat> for metasemantic problems with it. Um, well, we not only, mirror not only gives us this problem of metasemantics, it also gives us real, which gives us ontology, and all the headaches of ontology is the claim. <clears throat> and you might go, well, hang on, you're inferring something from the nature of language to how reality is, right? Like, for example, suppose we rejected mirror, but how my, my mind relates to the world, draw some conclusion about the general nature of reality. And isn't that illegitimate? Some people will say. And the answer is no, it isn't, because our view about reality is always a relational one. We always talk about, again, take the idea of reality in itself. Right? It's, it's defined by right, external to our mind. Right? That's what it means. So in other words, <clears throat> we are bringing in the mind <laughs> Right already, so it's perfectly legitimate to say, well, if the mind relates to the world in a different way, then reality must be different. Is how, I, and that's what I want to get to in the end. I want to say second order nihilism is going to follow if we take a certain non-mirror view. But before we get to that, <coughs> um, okay, I'm I'm going to just leap ahead because I'm conscious of time. Okay, so how do we get rid of the mirror view of the, the causal, the, the sort of the idea that reality is external, the mind is somehow internal, and there's got to be a causal relationship between reference 
and the representations and so on. Do we, <clears throat> how do we respond to that? One way, in Richard Rorty way, I don't know, I'm not, is to sort of get rid of reference in some sense. I, I think that's a very bad idea. I think there's reference. <clears throat> one could debate that. Here's, here's another way, and I think it's a common one, and that's, we, we get rid of the idea of the external world by saying everything is internal. That's more or less the constructivist idea. So by external world, we mean mind-independent world. So here's the position, right? What do you mean by external world? And here's a, there's misunderstandings about this, but here's one take. By external world, I mean mind-independent world. OK, let's get rid of that. Everything's mind dependent. We'll be anti realist. Okay, so <clears throat> we propose we should look at reality in general as internal, as a mind independent thing. Who takes that position? Well, Kant does, I think. I'm not, I've read the Critique of Pure Reason, got very much fascinated by it for a while. <clears throat> and that's kind of what. Kant does, right? In relation to the problems of metaphysics, he thought metaphysics leads to paradoxes, yes. <laughs> maybe not quite the ones that Kant thought were the paradoxes, maybe, maybe not, but he, he did definitely thought that. What was the cure to the paradoxes of metaphysics, of the idea of reality in itself, Ding an sich? It's go internal, man. He didn't quite put that with a t-shirt, but if he was Californian, if you can imagine Kant as a Californian, sorry, <laughs> deferring to Americans in the room, um, it would have been, you know, go internal, dude, or something like that. Um, what does that mean? It means you don't have to, and it, you can see this sort of argumentation in Putnam, you don't have to think of the causal relation securing your reference because your reference goes right out to reality itself. It doesn't fall short of, of the world itself. Why? Because, more or less, the numeral mind and reality <coughs> get together to make up the empirical mind and empirical reality. So, you know, my psychological states and also the <coughs> plastic things in the room, etc., are constituted by transcendental synthesis involving the noumenal mind and noumenal reality, etc. <clears throat> As Putnam says at the end of Reason, Truth and History, it's this idea that mind and reality get together to make up mind and reality. <clears throat> Second work, I don't think so. I think that there are serious problems with the constructivist approach. Um, <clears throat> I mean, ultimately, we have to tell a story about what this transcendental synthesis is, and then I think we get problems. Kant says, for example, that causation should not apply to reality in itself, but it has to apply to reality in itself, and so on. Uh, I don't think it works. <clears throat> Here's another way that, another thing that people say, say a lot, uh, my students sort of often say it, they say, well, your mind fabricates the world in some sense. Sepia warp hypothesis, conceptual schemes somehow organize or construct the world. The world is a construction in that sense. <clears throat> I'm speaking very, very generally here. Um, okay, I don't think that's going to work. Here's one reason why. It's still a metaphysical view. It's still saying that sort of the world is made up of ingredients, a mind and something that's not mind, and then one thing, the mind, does a sort of construction involving the other. And then as soon we get caught up in metaphysical questions again, well, what is that? We say, we say, what is that construction? And does the mind itself construct itself, for example, is a question. Right. So I think we get sucked back into uh, metaphysical questions. In other words, I, we could say the same thing about Kant, and I think this was the reaction to Kant when the critique came out a few years, within 10 years, people are saying, Kant, back to doing metaphysics, right? You were meant to seal off metaphysics and, and metaphysics and stop it, but actually you get sucked back into it. As soon as we ask, well, how does the construction work? <clears throat> Same thing with Kant, I don't know, some people here might be more 
better at Carnap than me. Uh, Carnap interestingly says, look, we should think of everything we talk about as internal to a language conceptual scheme. And as for these questions of ex its external reality, the external reality of anything we talk about, it's somehow confused. We shouldn't talk about that. Okay, I, I don't want to go for that either. <clears throat> um, here's some reasons. Are languages themselves internal things? I mean, does, does lang do languages themselves have a reality and a self-status or not? Um, isn't linguistic, isn't it this, this a form of idealism, constructive idealism, after all? <clears throat> Won't you get caught back into those metaphysical questions again? Because idealism is a form of metaphysics. Uh, Thomason does interesting things. I don't know her work enough, but she's a kind of deflationist and she wants to say, yeah, by existence we mean nothing more than satisfied by predicates. That's an interesting thing, way to go. <clears throat> I'm worried that you can't allow quantification over non-existent things on her perspective, but we do quantify over things that don't exist. <clears throat> and what's satisfaction? <laughs> right, in other words, yeah. So I think uh, internalism, very, very large, big picture things going on here at this point. Uh, it's still going to be an ontological view. It's still telling us what reality ultimately consists in, namely it's ultimately constructed, right? So, um, so it doesn't escape questions of ultimate nature, but the questions of ultimate nature are the ones we want to escape, according to my diagnosis. <clears throat> and I think similar things, panpsychism, for example, is very popular at the moment. Everyone's being panpsychist or cosmopsychist, etc. These are forms of non-constructive idealism. I think we're just stuck back in metaphysics, and they have their problems, like the re the combination problem or the decom. The combination problem. I don't know if you're familiar with any of these problems, but they they look like run-of-the-mill metaphysical problems. Same old ones. Okay. <clears throat> so, <sighs> can you take more? Sorry, I know. <clears throat> okay. So in 15 minutes, I just want to sketch out what I think is the right way to go. <clears throat> So, part four, the dawning, light glimmering, sorry, according to this <clears throat> narrative. Is there, is there another way of escaping metaphysics that might be better, assuming it doesn't work, that, than constructivist approaches? And I'm going to say, yeah, it's this killing... Killing off mirror, killing off the causal, quasi-causal explanatory ideas of reference, etc. How can we do that? We've got to get rid of mirror. <clears throat> and the answer is, we should accept global expressivism. Uh, so roughly, I'm even going to jump over that. <clears throat> roughly, I'm going to say something like this, that the facts we begin with, when we try and think about language and reality, are not as the kind of mind is internal, reality external picture suggests. It's not like that. We should begin with facts of reference, facts of minds referring to things. In fact, I think, following Barclay, there's no such thing as something that's not being referred to. <laughs> Sorry, we could go on about that. In other words, reference and reality arise together. That doesn't mean you're an idealist. It's just noting that, in fact, you can't think of anything that's not being referred to. As Barclay said, it's a kind of <coughs> contradiction to think of something you're not quantifying over. And, and that relates to these puzzles that people have about an unrestricted domain of quantification. They go, well, you know, is it possible that I can't refer to everything? Is there something out there that I'm not quantifying over? Well, you just quantified over it <laughs> in stating the fact that you can't quantify over it. So the answer is no, there isn't. So to cut a long story short, maybe it's a long story, 
We should just begin with these facts of reference. And here's the claim I want to put forward. Non-mirror, the non-mirror conception. So this is really a, how to think about the relation between, or how, how to think of how reference and perception arises. It's the following. For any talk or thought about, uh, or perception of those, owes themselves, and this is the denial of mirror, the thing you're referring to or perceiving, has no explanatory role in the account of how you get to refer to it or perceive it. There is no explanatory, fundamental explanatory relation going on, right, as in the causal theory of reference. You know, I refer to something, so that means that thing in some way is ultimately a causal origin of my representation. That's his role. <laughs> In other words, the referent never has an explanatory role in the account of how you get to refer to it. Right, it might sound a bit crazy, but that's going to be the view. <clears throat> it's worth just pausing that, right? Um, I'm going to illustrate what I mean by that in a moment. But <clears throat> so that's clear. So O's, the things you refer to, the reference, are not part of the explanatory grounding base for facts of the form this mind refers to or perceives O. How, do, what, how would we understand that idea? And the answer is through global expressivism, because that's exactly what it says. So I'm going to illustrate what that is. So here's the thought. <clears throat> um, in fact, I'll leap, because this may be more familiar. I don't know, has anyone sort of thought of, encountered expressivism about moral morals? Is there any, anyone here? Yeah. Started off as a motivism, became in, in the 20s or whatever, probably with Wittgenstein number one, Tractatus Wittgenstein, sort of, and it, it sort of evolved to the view that saying that when I say something is good, I go, oh, that's good, that's bad. What I'm doing is expressing emotion. <clears throat> not. My mind is not, as it were, beaming out to intuit goodness or beaming out to intuit badness. It's rather expressing some motivational response to the world. <clears throat> you get that a more sophisticated version of that idea, right, with other bits. So I don't want to add those bits because that becomes a long business of explaining machinery. It's a bit boring. So, but here's the intuitive idea. When I say something is good, right, <clears throat> little beam for the goodness of something out there, I am expressing output from an effective response to the world. So in other words, something in the world is causing this effective response. But the thing in the world causing this effective response isn't goodness, right? Goodness doesn't have some explanatory role at this point. Well, what's causing that, expo ex uh, that, uh, that effective response? Well, I don't know, just some features of things. Like you taste something, you have a Greek lunch, and you go, hmm, almost good, you know? So you're, you've got an effective response to some feature of the world. But Good. And that's how you get to talk about goodness. Strange. This is a non-mirror view. It's not that the goodness caused right, the reference to itself. No, it's something else that's natural. We like, people like to say oh, natural features of the world. It's cause, the causation is going here, going, hmm, good, and reference to goodness. So goodness the goodness in the world, the goodness of the hummus, or the goodness of the act by the person, isn't the explanatory origin of the talk about it, right? Unlike the mirror view, the causal theory of reference says. Okay. <clears throat> and you go, well, what about this relationship? And the answer is, yeah, well, it turns out that tastiness or goodness in things does have a relationship to certain features in the world, yeah, but that's not part of the ex explanation of how the reverence works, 
It's rather that once that system is up in place, you go around and go, oh, as a matter of fact, certain features of food, for example, you know, we respond to those as saying good, right? And <clears throat> certain features of acts, etc., we respond to that with being good act, etc. Okay. Cut the a long story short. Oh, sorry, you're, you're no longer working. We say that about everything. Oh, sorry, was that? Yeah. Um, good. Uh, I think we should think of perceptions like that as well. Give up the course of theory of perception. Sorry? In other words, when I perceive the banana, what's the causation is happening at some microphysical level? It doesn't involve the banana. Right? Because at the microphys relevant microphysical level, you won't find the banana. There is no, as a world, well, well-defined beginning or end of the banana. You can't define a banana at the microphysical level. Yet, there you are, perceiving a banana. Okay, reject the causal theory of perception. This is very broad kind of stuff. It's just wrong to say that the intentional object, the object can go, ah, oh, that banana is causing your perception of it. Rather, you've got some microphysical stuff happening. And later on, with that system in operation, you can go, oh, actually, when you tweak the microphysics, you can see that there's an interesting relationship between the microphysics and the banana appearance. But <clears throat> that's not. That's after the system is in operation. Reject the causal theory of perception. <clears throat> um, OK, so this is what I'm going to do in about five minutes. We're just going to export, just going to generalize that story. In other words, for every bit of discourse you're talking about, for all your assertions, judgments, and your beliefs, every domain where you have assertions or beliefs or judgments, right? Judgments about goodness, judgments about bananas, judgments about, you name it, numbers, references to numbers, references to bananas, reference to goodness, etc., etc in all those very different domains of talk, <clears throat> we're going to give the same sort of story in which, just as in the case of morals, right, <clears throat> the systems that underpin your judgments don't involve causal response to the reference. The reference don't have an explanatory role in the account of how you get to talk about them or to make judgments about them, etc may seem a bit strange, but that's what generalizing expressivism, expressivism from the moral case across the board works. So how does that going to work? Well, something like this, sort of, here's a rough schematic thing. So we've got all these assertions, etc., with different topics, different areas. And the systems, we're going to be a bit speculative about the machinery that drives speech act. There is that machinery. But it works by interaction with the world. Yeah, you've got to interact with the world. <clears throat> but in these all sorts of different ways. One way is by motivational, something preceding it really, but motivational affective response to bits of reality. That's the moral stuff coming out. Or you can have things preceding perceptual systems. Okay, that's going to be the talk of bananas or etc. Uh, manipulation is an interesting one. Manipulate things. That's going to be fed into judgments about causation. In other words, your judgments about causation doesn't work by your mind beaming in on causation. It rather works by you banging things when, as we were saying in lunch, you know, you bang things when you're a kid. You manipulate it. You you intervene manipulatively in the world, and that's what's underlying. <clears throat> judgments about causation. So causation itself has no explanatory role in the account of how you get to talk about causation. Uh, and so on. So, uh, <clears throat> talk of bananas, talk of causation, the picture for causation is like this. So you've got this interesting mental state, someone thinking about causation, saying some of the scissors cause the hole in the banana. Okay, 
sort of, you saw the <coughs> scissors go into the banana or something like that. I don't know why I'm thinking about that, because I had pictures of bananas. But. <coughs> okay. What underlies those judgments is not that your mind beams in on that mysterious thing called causation. But as the mirror view would say, right? You sort of hook onto causation out there in the world to refer to it. No, it's rather the outputs of this system of manipulation that ultimately you're expressing when you go, oh, that thing falling down caused the banana to have a hold on it, etc. Non-mirror. Um, supervenience. The Mao image supervenes on the pixels, right? You go, wow, oh, where did that Mao image come from? Uh, various different kinds of pixels, etc., etc. And you go, oh, that's cool. You know, famous image. Everyone recognizes that as a famous. You can see Andy Warhol's pictures of Mao, etc., and so on. Uh, how does that work? Does your mind glue onto, or as it were, beam in, or is it? Does does the grounding cause your mind to refer to the grounding? No, it's rather a manipulation of pixels. If you learn how to paint, you know how to manipulate pixels to get images, right? So, non-mirror again. <clears throat> or, here's the really interesting one, or maybe not interesting one. Meaning, right? One of the things you can do automatically is you understand perceived meanings. In fact, you can't turn off your meaning perceiving system. Late at night, you're trying to get to sleep, but you can hear a conversation in the yard across from your place. If you live in London, everything's sort of very squashed together. You just perceive the meanings, you can't turn it off. Okay, what's going on? Is it that your mind locks, that the meanings themselves or the meaningful sentences themselves are causing your representations of meaning? That's the mirror view. No. It's rather your mind has a subsystem, processing system that reacts to word patterns in context, etc., spontaneously generates outputs which you express by going, oh, that means I sold, you know, I went to Turkey to get new teeth or something like that. Sorry, I'm thinking of some annoying conversation. Meaningful sentences. So, your reference to meaning doesn't operate as mirror suggests. It's non-mirror. The reference, the meanings, have no explanatory role in account of how you get to refer to the meanings. It's kind of weird, but there it is. Okay, <clears throat> and it goes on. Uh, a few minor points here about if you try and generalize that, etc., that kind of account. Issues of reflexivity. Yeah, the very concepts you use and the account of how you get, the, in other words, you're going to talk about a causal system underlying the mind. Uh, you're going to ex expressively analyze that as well. No problem. I see no contradiction with that. And uh, you've got to worry about things like objectivity. Instead of giving a theory of objectivity, you give a theory of how we talk about the objective, <laughs> right? Uh, actually, I wrote a paper on this in the Aristotelian Society from 2011. It was about faultless disagreement. Expressivist treatment of objective. Okay, and the same with truth, etc. So you completely refuse, in some sense, to do a definition you don't offer a definition of truth, for example. You don't do semantics, really. You just tell the story about what goes on in the production of utterances and referential states, etc., etc., but in non-mirror terms. Okay, so that's the view. So in the last five minutes, <coughs> we're in the home stretch, everyone. Thank you for bearing with me. I don't know how long this has taken. Uh, is the second order nihilism. <coughs> so Here's the condition. If I just try to give you the idea of non-mirror. Okay. Uh, if you accept non-mirror, we've already shown the relationship between mirror and real. If you go for non non-mirror, you're gonna have non-real. <laughs> non-real meaning got no real definitions for things. That, that's the thing, right? So all theoretical identities owes everything you're talking about, whatever it is, owes what's goodness, properties, truth, you name it. 
because it's all you've told this story about how do you get to refer to these things, right? It's in this non-mirror account. Consequence of that is that you can't have any true theoretical identities of this form. The O's are ultimately what are X's? What is goodness, right? What is goodness? G. E. Moore said, "Goodness is this non-natural, primitive property in things." Is he right? No, he can't be right. Why? Because if non-mirror is correct, that can't be right. Why? Sort of roughly like this. My talk of, if G.E. Moore was right, that goodness is a non-natural property of things, you know, then it would have to have been the case, as it were, all along, that when I was using the word good, right, my mind was boom, beaming in on this non-natural property so as to get to refer to goodness. But it didn't. My mind, according to my hypothesis, is partly empirical. My mind was working in terms of motivational response to the world. Non-natural primitive properties of goodness had nothing to do with that. If that's right, then you can't say, oh, we've discovered what goodness is. Right? It's this non-natural property. Okay. Um, what about properties? Right? I'm using sorry, properties. I'm using predicates all the time, right? Every predicate I use, you know, use the word predit, and red, or if I'm trying to speak French, I say, ça c'est moche. So moche is a predicate, is that? Sorry, is, a, is that, can you say that in public? You know, moche, uh, uh, et cetera. Any predicate I use, you can convert it and say, oh, mocheness, or goodness, or redness, or Two-ness, if you're talking about numbers, right? They, you can convert them into things that apparently refer to properties. Okay? We do that all the time. Yeah, what are properties? If non-mirror is right, there's no answer to that question. Not in the sense that, oh, it, it transcends my mind. <laughs> or, oh, I'll just have to be humble and say, I can't say. <laughs> No, I think you can be quite robustly non-humble and say, there's no answer to that question because there's nothing that it consists in. Why? Because, take any theory you have about what properties are. Ah, oh, properties are sets. Okay, so they're elite sets or special, <coughs> natural, definable in terms of natural properties sets, and those natural properties are ultimately sets or functions across possible worlds, right? You could come up with that answer, Lewisian type answer. You can say, well, yeah, if that was right, then my talk all along when I've been using predicates, etc., must have involved my mind beaming into these things, but it never was. My mind's actually been reacting in these sort of ways to different things, etc., that does not involve me grasping extensions of predicates, thank God. So, if that's right, no theoretical identity of the form properties are ultimately sets of such and such description can be right. So what are properties? And the right answer is say, second order nihilism. Just can't say. There are properties. You know. It's a useful way of talking. Right, here's the pragmatism. Can't stop talking that way. I can say of people that both the they exhibit the great qualities of generals, you know, both etc. Yeah, but what are properties? Nothing. Well, sorry. Ultimately nothing. Well, sorry, ultimately not anything would be a better way of putting it. So here's the question. What gets expressed when I say O is real or O really exists, right? Like what's the non-mirror account of what goes on when I say O that exists, etc. And the answer is not because my mind is being caused, developing that concept, that representation of existence by beaming in on existence itself, or something like that. I had no intuitions about existence. No intellectual, intellectual anschauungen. Is that a word? I can't talk about intellectual intuitions, right? Uh, what are you doing? Well, you're expressing, and it's sort of a bit of a technical answer. When I say that's real, or that really exists, or something, I'm expressing a predoxastic state, a functional state, where the O's file, we could talk about files, but without thinking of them as inherently representational things, 
has been activated through certain can canonical pathways. So if I use the word, oh, that, that ship really exists, it's because, to cut a long story short, me or others, etc., have used the relevant predicates and gone, and they've had an activation and a perceptual encounter, let's say, where you go, ship, right? And that's what, in the end, complicated story you're expressing. It might involve other people through testimony chains. Don't have to worry about that. Okay, so use of exists or real involves no grasping of existence or reality. So, if not, and that's a non mirror. So that means if non mirror implies, non mirror implies non real, the principle of reality, then that applies to existence. So there is no ultimate account of what reality is. So that implies no ontology, rather second order nihilism. What's the interest of second order nihilism? I'm going to, this is like last few slides. So take problems of ontology. Take problems of ontology, like the cup. Sorry, you're there sipping coffee and you're going, what are you, cup? Account for yourself. Are you a composite thing? Yes. Are you a... What is this mode of composition? Tell me what that is. Oh. Long story short, you go, well, you must be a sort of special kind of brute composition, but that's impossible. Uh, I can't give any good theory about what constitutes this composition relationship between all your parts, so I doubt if you exist. Or maybe I go another way, I say, every myriological fusion of things exists, etc. Something like that. In which case I'm stuck with lots of weird things. What's the answer for second order nihilism is to say, well, the cup. First off, it's vague what parts are parts of the cup. But secondly, the cup has no ultimate nature, because when you get the non-mirror account of how you get to talk about cups, as it were, your mind's not beaming into some prefabricated da -da -da structure in reality, such that by beaming into that, you get to talk about cups. <clears throat> Rather, all theoretical identities about what the cup is are void, are null and void. And the same thing also holds for the mind and its relationship to reality. So here's one thing people worry about, they worry about dualism. What is the mind? The physicalist says the mind is ultimately a physical thing. The idealist typically says, no, that's false. Physical things are ultimately bits of mind. The Cartesian dualist, or some other form of dualist, says, ah, there's ultimately this mind stuff, and there's this physical stuff, and they kind of get together and somehow relate to each other. Hmm, how do they relate to each other? What does the second order nihilist say? It says, oh, there's mind. There are thoughts, there are feelings, etc. There are qualia, you name it. Feels. And there's a physical world too, and there's a brain. In fact, there's the brain is in this sort of interesting relations that can be explored. But guess what? On the non-mirror view, the mental states have no ultimate nature, the relationship between them has no ultimate nature, and the physical things, non-mind things, have no ultimate nature. So when you say you're worried about the relationship between these things, it's not that you've got two fundamental met metaphysical building blocks that somehow have to be glued together to make up the world. There are no metaphysical building blocks here. They have no ultimate nature to them. So you can't really pose the problem of, kind of like the hard problem of consciousness, let's say, which is really a sort of problem about, well, how could something in its nature, so utterly alien to the nature of the physical, somehow be correlated with the physical, or arise out of the physical? And the right answer for the second uh, order nihilists is to say, well, they don't have any ultimate natures. So rather we observe, or we know, as a matter of fact, by interacting with things that 
when you tweet brain states, you get certain, you can get certain kinds of things going on. Just in the same way as you look at Mao images, <clears throat> you tweet the pixels and you get a Mao image, or you don't get a Mao image, right? So you could talk about the hard problem. I don't think Mao images can be reduced to actual pixelation, some definite set of pixelations, it can't. So you can't, there's no reduction here. But we're not worried about some dualism, metaphysical dualism of Mao images and pixels, right? The right thing to say here is that's all based on the assumption of inherent nature or ultimate nature being assigned to things. That's what's causing the problems. So <clears throat> if you give up the real world in that sense, your home. Um, I'm going to stop there and say, well, in the end, actually, what you end up with is a view which I every now and then I think is related to what Schrodinger was trying to get at in his book on what is life. But here I'm going to hand wave a bit. But it's more like this. Instead of giving a theory of what constitutes things such that we justify our intuitions about them, that's what ontology does, You've got rather a theory that's going to be more like a kind of cognitive science that's going to say, look, given these pathways, non-mirror pathways, we can explain why we have the intuitions that we have about things. But that's part of a sort of project in some extended non-representational mode of cog sci in some sense. But that's it. So I've, what I've tried to do is look at, look at what the problems of ontology are. Uh, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Oh, I've got, I've got through a lot of slides. Thank God. <clears throat> I tried to say ontology is caught up with these ideas of real definition. I tried to argue that it's sort of related to a certain view about the mind's relation to reality. <coughs> I've looked at how we could get rid of that view about how we think of the mind's relation to reality, and I looked at global expressivism as an answer to that. And in global expressivist non-mirror framework, Real, the idea that reality has an ultimate definition, just simply doesn't hold. The opposite holds. We can only have reality because it's empty. Empty of ultimate nature. <clears throat> Which is, according to me, and here I have a disagreement with Jan Westerhoff, but he's not here, and he knows more about Buddhism than me. <clears throat> I can't help feeling, it's what the Buddhists are talking about. At least Mahayana Buddhists, when they say, from the Heart Sutra, don't you know Sariputta? This is the Buddha talking to someone. This body is void. You look into the body, and there ain't nothing there defining the body. And this voidness is body. Right? That could be what they're talking about, second order nihilism. Thank you. Sorry for going on too long. <clears throat>
as an extension of ontological methods. And I think I get a feeling that many people do this in social ontology. The, they're into questions of grounding and so forth. And that's where I would get off the bus. But I'm, I'm not, I, I can't be against improving concepts for certain purposes and ditching others, which we don't want to use anymore. And I'm happy that concepts change over time. So in other words, there's no sort of essential core to concepts such that we, we can't talk about the same concept changing. I mean, that's just as we, the way we say English has evolved. Let's say I'm talking English at the moment, but say about any natural language, they change through time. Um, <clears throat> things that are analytic, cease to be analytic and so forth. So I think that fits in with a, with a non-ontological orientation. So maybe I want to say, um, sort of a second order nihilism would fit better with an ameliorative sort of an idea, an ameliorative project, maybe. I don't know if that's answering your question. Okay, and the second one, this came in actually before you talked about it a little more, so you may have already had, you may have already mm -hmm. said what you have to say about this, but I'll pose it anyway just to be, to be safe. Uh, Simon Sapolsky asked, can you, can you say more about the differences between your account and Thomason's view? It seems that she and Price could be classified as proponents of exactly what you're calling second order nihilism. Uh -huh. Isn't Thomason saying that we can talk about existing things, but existence is understood in a deflationary way, so it seems very close to Yeah, you. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I assume that, uh, people, <clears throat> that I put myself in such august, august company. No, no, but I mean, it, it, so their view is quite well known. Uh, so I think there's fellow travelers in the sense that we don't like metaphysics, <laughs> in the sense of what I would call positive metaphysics. Um, but I see, so take Thompson, I find her views much clearer, in some ways, clearer, maybe in some respects, than, than Price's, maybe his is a bit more complex. Um, so <coughs> deflationism, and this is in, in Price as well, I think, Deflationism is, an, is a way of doing ontology, but with a small footprint. So in other words, you want, your, you want to minimize ontological impact. And I think that goes back to, let's say, the way Horwich sold his view about truth. In other words, you're actually still offering definitions, right? You're saying truth doesn't have a deep problematic definition, <clears throat> like correspondence or coherence, etc. It's got a shallow definition in terms of T-schema, sentences, <clears throat> maybe infinitistic, whatever, but there it is. Um, I'm already against that. I think that it is problematic ontologically. So, yeah, I understand why you want to minimise the impact of your definitions by going deflationary, but you're, you're still going to encounter the problems of definition from my point of view. So this is where, where I differ. So Thomson, from my, my understanding, and I don't know her work well, but I kind of know it a bit, she wants to say something like this, that exists, should be understood purely in this deflationary terms, as in something exists because it satisfies a bunch of predicates. That's it. You've got no further, cri no further ontological criteria to meet to, as it would be said, to exist or not. And that, I kind of like the spirit of that. But I have problems, two kinds of problems. First kind of problem is, well, what do you mean by satisfies predicates? Uh, secondly, I'm worried that things like this happen. Uh, King Arthur satisfies predicates, like King Arthur, everyone knows the fictional character or whatever, or mythological character. King Arthur is a king, was a king, to, uh, pulled out the sword, had the knights of the round table, etc. Right, so, but you're going to say, oh yeah, but that it didn't really satisfy those predicates. So it seems to me, I'm worried, she's, her view implies that we can't talk about non-existent things. Because, because in some sense, the non-existent things, the quantification of the non-existent is going to be problematic from her point of view because we still have predicate satisfaction. Now, she may deal with that problem by saying, well, they don't really satisfy the predicates. 
But then I think you're going to be sucked back into a view about well, what do you mean by really satisfies predicates as opposed to not really satisfies predicates. And that's why we're going to get sucked back into a theory of existence in a more substantial sense. That's, that's my current way of thinking about her view, but that may turn out to be wrong. But th that's, that's where it is. And as for Price's view, Price is a kind of, I think, quietist <coughs> who just doesn't want to talk about metaphysics anymore. So he's a bit like uh, Rorty used to be, like Rorty would just say, look, sorry guys, you can play that language game if you want, but I'm not interested. Uh, I don't think I have that view. I think that this is partly because Price thinks, I believe, that... There is no, as it were, specifically uh, metaphysical, <clears throat> call it, criterion that ontologists are using to make their judgments about what exists or doesn't exist. Somehow they're just a bit confused. They're caught up in external questions, etc., which have no real content to them. I think that's false. I think that they're concerned with questions of real definition. It's perfectly sensible. In fact, I think. It's intuitive to do that. It just turns out to be false, and probably necessarily false. That's where I'm at. Question, James? Hey, Tom? Um, okay, so it, just to be sure that I understand, because so what I, I thought I understood, and now with your answer, I'm less sure. So you're trying to aim to really for a position just between the constructivist and the, the real, uh, the, the mirror, okay, so let's accept the mirror position makes no sense, I agree with you, I won't discuss that. But, but the constructivist, like a catnap, would say, yeah, but you're still, you're two feet in the metaphysics in your middle of the road position because you presume a lot of stuff about practice brains, action and and he would say he would say maybe he would say I don't know but he would say nah I don't do that I say okay linguistic framework how would not any linguistic framework it's practice saying that this linguistic framework is interesting mathematics science art whatever it's coming from from practice but I don't say anything about their relation to stuff and how I just think their authority, they come from, they, they are successful, we think they are interesting. And even maybe King Archer in certain circumstances, in certain linguistic framework could be, I could do some existent judgment about King Archer in this framework because it's accepted by this community and this practice. So am I understanding clearly that you, you dislike some aspect of the constructivist, so you try to have this position between the two, or... And that's, a, that's always an uncomfortable when you try to be between... between yeah, um, yeah, I like to think I'm not between them. So, so in the following sense, so first off, this metaphor, in between or whatever, I still think constructivists are... <clears throat> they're caught up in they're still caught up in ontology they're almost getting out the door as it were but the ontologist their coat their, the, the tails of their coat are still inside and they're dragging them in right? so I think that there are traces of ontological thinking still in their view and that's why they're a problem that, that's, whereas I'm trying to completely sort of remove it um, so, you may know more, I'm sure you know more about Carnap than I, so um, what I'm saying may not be right doing justice to Carnap. But <clears throat> when I talk about, so there's my picture of a, you know, talk about stuff, right? So I talk about a system, which is, a, I think, a natural system. So here I agree with Price. The explanation of what's going on in language is naturalistic. It's going to talk about underlying functional states, etc. But I'm not a functionalist. I'm not saying mental states are functional or something like that. Um, it's not a bit of metaphysics in the sense it's not an attempt to talk about the nature of reality in general. 
It's not saying this is reality in itself. It's no commitment to that. It's just saying things happen. Just as we say, oh look, there's a cup on the table, or there's a tree outside, etc. It's just... So, I'm not a first-order analyst. I say, yeah, of course there are people... Well, I'm a bit doubtful about people, but, but that's for other reasons. No, but the, there are things in the world, etc. going on. Um, I just think it's a natural approach, given non-mirror, which has, if you accept it, has these consequences. Though, I do admit, this is not physicalistic. I mean, the, what's down here is, call it non-mental. What's up here is mental, right? But that looks like a dualism, but later on I want to show, actually, it's not a problematic metaphysical dualism. Um, Carnap, however, I feel that when Carnap introduces his idea of linguistic frameworks, he wants them to, the way he speaks about it, as if to say, and I think this is what Thomason is being helpful and helping us understand Carnap better, I think. But the answer is, well, how is it that by introducing a language, I introduce a domain of reality, right? I mean, language in one sense is just, right, uh, some strings with syntax. But the language for Carnap is more than that. It involves quantification and reference. And for me, Carnap doesn't explain where that comes from. It's just rather a, you know, he doesn't in any way... So, so I kind of agree with Carnap. There are just facts of reference out there. But I then try and show you why that's not metaphysically loaded in any problematic way. That's my attempt. Believe it or not, the, the second order nihilism says, don't be worried, I'm not a me metaphysical dualist for these reasons. Whereas with Carnap, I'm going, well, you've just introduced reference and you're not explaining it. You're not showing why. Well, where did that come from? Uh, how do I get to really talk about numbers? Not as themselves just marks on a page, like a formalist might want to say, but as literally things I'm referring to, right, which are distinct from the marks, how, where does that happen? And not our ideas, etc. Um, I don't see... He's like he's sweeping those questions under the carpet. From my Because he's a constructivist, so... Well, fine, but then that means to me constructivism is just an attempt by fiat to avoid metaphysical problems, which can happen. Um, and secondly, his language systems are not themselves constructions, right? So they have reality in itself. So that's what I'm worried about. They come, they come from practice. Right, but uh, good. But then what is practice? Because this is one of the problems I have with Brandom and maybe with uh, some of uh, Hugh Price's. Practice on one level is non-intentional. Just people causally moving marks around. Or, you know, causally interacting with the world. But then you could say, well, yeah, but how does that give rise to meaning? And they go, well, that's the very problem I'm puzzled by. Or it already incorporates meaning and normativity, in which case I say, well, you're just asking me not to worry about that. That is an approach to metaphysics. So, for example, that's what Lewis used to do when metaphysical things got too difficult. Sorry, I'm, this is a a negative characterization of Lewis, but it's the following. When, when problems get too difficult, you just don't go there. So, for example, the debate he had with David Armstrong about universals, I don't know, does any... Uh, they got to the problem of primitive predication. What constitutes the fact that a, a thing has a universal, in the case of Armstrong, or what, happened, what, what is it for a, an object to be a member of a set? Lewis says, treat that as ideology. It's just part of, we won't investigate it metaphysically. Fine. But that's just saying, I can't do metaphysics anymore. That's, that that idea, the ideology, ontology distinction is itself a distinction that is just sort of saying, look, there are limits to doing metaphysics. You just can't investigate these questions. You get, it's too difficult or just too paradoxical. It's, it's a bit because, for example, predication is really problematic. Think of the third man problem, I don't know, the what con you know, Frege's concept of a horse problem. It's really a bit of a nightmare. I, so people close that down. I think 
you know, if you just say, well, we'll allow meaningful practice already, don't investigate it, to me is, you're just saying it's too difficult. <laughs> but but the, you see, the, the question is, yeah. or we continue to do metaphysics of mirror, blah, 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 or we don't do it at all. <laughs> we say it's not legitimate at all. And the discussion is between the people that are trying to to do neither. So uh, Karnap would say, maybe maybe he would say, but uh, Quine already argue against his position quite quite firmly, but would say, yeah, okay, yeah. Or I don't ask question of ontology and language, like Wittgenstein, they are there, they are a language game, I can study them as something as complicated as the living world. So it's, I, I, I cannot have a position, ontological position on language, I just study them. Yeah. Or, or I say, okay, I want to save some part of the practice of metaphysics, which I think was what Carnap wanted to do. So I want still to be able to say there exists and I can have a judgment about existence. But I have to get rid of all the mirror stuff. So I have to. So he was maybe stuck with, okay, I can only work in language frame because I don't want to talk about the real thing outside because that's illegitimate. So maybe you wanted to have the butter and the, 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 what's the word? It's the butter and, no, the butter and the, the money of the butter. <laughs> Le butter and the butter. Oh, yeah, the to money of both ways, cake and eat it. Oh, the cake and eat it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the cake and eat it. Don't, don't mention to me, that to me as a survivor of Brexit. So um, maybe, <laughs> maybe that was, uh, that, um, that was the point. Well, but, uh, hang on. Yeah, so, um, <coughs> Here you go. So I think Carnap would sign up to um, sort of almost pragmatism, right? Mm -hmm. We've got all these lang different ways of speaking, different languages, or sorry, different sub-languages, different vocabularies, and we talk about different things. And, and we don't want to then go into some investigation about which one really corresponds to reality. Which one's real, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I agree with that. <clears throat> um, the only issue is how do we get to that almost pragmatist view? Right? The only so I identify it as um, so what. Here are people arguing about what exists. People say, "Oh, a certain prime number doesn't exist, or does, or." certain kinds of human beings exist or don't exist, like witches don't exist, or certain kinds of particles in physics exist or don't exist. Okay, good. They're the good things. They're the good questions of existence. So we should continue with those. But then we got this sort of bad one where we go, oh, that doesn't exist for such and such reasons. Okay. And then we want to sort of exclude those cases, right? So there's a certain kind of practice. In the pragmatism. Yeah, there, there's a certain kind of practice, a certain kind of activity going on, intellectual, where people go, oh, that doesn't exist. Like, those cups don't exist. Why? Oh, because of the problem of, special problem of composition. And uh, we want to exclude those. I want to, I want a criterion for excluding them. And I, I think what, what's common to them all is that they're all questions about ultimate definition. Ultimate yeah. questions of reality. That's definition. That, that, that's not the first time that you come back with the, where you really dislike this. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 no, no. no. <laughs> identity and uh, criteria. And yeah, identity. yeah, because I think can't, people go, oh, what's ontology about? It's about what exists. Yeah, but it's about coming up with a criterion mm -hmm. for what exists and then applying it. You know, <clears throat> the normalist says the only criterion of existence is must be causally you know, reactive to the world or whatever, or must be in space and time, or something like that. So, but I think in the end, it's really about this thing about ultimate definition, ultimate constitution. And I feel that, Ka so here's one difference with Carnap. I feel that Carnap 
isn't relieving me from the problem of, let's say, to take one example, special composition. Mm. Right? I go, well, kind of, what's your view? You know, and he allows quantification over like cups or whatever, you have cup talk. And then I go, yeah, but like, what's its relation? And I think this in the end is, what's the relationship with the language game that talks about ordinary objects, cups and stuff? And the language that talks about microphysical things, you know, like how do they relate? Yeah, that, that's the objection of Quine to Carnap. Good. So then I'm, I'm with, <laughs> with Quine on that one. You know, you, yeah. How do you do that, this distinction? Yeah. So I think I can answer that. It's, as an aside, it was just a, a random comment, a comment that was thrown in online. David Fisher said, for what it's worth, Quine probably definitely didn't believe in real definition. Right? So. Oh, good. Okay. So that's interesting. So, so, but here's the thing, I, I think methodologically, I kind of disagree with that to some extent. I think that Quine says, I've forgotten which, maybe it's in one of his, maybe it's in um, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, or maybe it's in On What Exists. He says, no identity without, sorry, no entity without identity. So he, he's against essences. He says something like, what is it? The, this is a great quote from Two Dogmas of Empiricism where he talks about the museum of meaning is the museum of essences. He's against essence. Yeah, he's against essence and he's against intentional entities, etc. Why? Because he doesn't think that they have respectable identity conditions. He doesn't think they're like sets. He likes sets. Oh, they have respectable identity conditions. Namely, a set's identity conditions are given by its members, etc. So he loves this extensionality. That is, to me, kind of a re real definition methodology in operation. It's this distinguishing between ontologically dubious things and ontologically acceptable things. Right? Not on the basis of pragmatic reasons, but on the basis of, well, they're just dodgy. We can't define their, their identity conditions, propositions, for example, or non he doesn't think we should quantify over non-existent things. Why? Well, there's no identity that you can define for, you know. So and that, to me, is the methodology of that. Fisher, Mark? Uh, David Fisher. Yeah, David Fisher. That, that's my response to that. That's a very interesting question. So I think he's sort of, with one hand, he is appealing to real de definition instincts. In fact, to get rid of certain ideas that are related to real definitions, namely essence, etc. Uh, that's what I think I'd say. Other questions? I'm the AU major about writing a popular book. So I was just wondering what would you put this in a book or like if you had to write an HRC case study about the impact. Just to, to get a hold on. What can one Oh, oh yeah, right. What would I do? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, what, do you, joke. what do you know about impact? Um, and yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, impact. Um, well, I mean, you've got to be good at coming up with fictions about impact. But uh, I, I mean, I suppose, this is what I would say. Maybe overblowing the, you know, exaggerating a bit. But I, 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 I think. Um, in th this cognitive illusion, here's the, here's the claim, there's a kind of cognitive illusion about metaphysics. It's kind of, we're a bit addicted to it. We want to find, we, we, we take seriously these questions, even in the popular media, they talk about what is it to be British, you know, in the modern world, or what is it to be, you know, straight or a woman or a you name it, or a man, or a, in, in other words, we get caught up with definition and we want to draw d division, lines of division. And in fact, we get very worried about these points of division, who goes in, who goes out, etc. And I think that reflects this implicit subscription signing up to these, these uh, ideas of kind of ultimate reality. In other words, the ontologist is actually caught up in the same mechanisms of mind that the, in the more popular discourse we get caught up with when we start saying, look, this is what it's to be a real French, right? Right, we don't want, sorry, I don't know if that sort of, but certainly that discourse 
happens politically all the time. And that's particularly so with vagueness and slippery slope arguments and, and things like that. So, and also, I, so in other words, uh, some deeper reflections maybe on, on that mechanism, if it is indeed one, would kind of release some of that addiction to identi identification, right? And I think maybe that's what Buddhists are talking about when they talk about identity being a kind of addiction. We want to define what we are, right? And here's the thought, where we're not, there is no, there's no uh, ultimate reality to being French, being English, being gay, being straight, being woman, you name it. And yet there are these distinctions. Then It's not like nothing. And I think that gives you a different perspective, which I think might be socially interesting if we had a society perhaps that kind of bought into that in some way. I don't know who would. Would you give me the funding one? <laughs> yeah. Other questions? I don't know, but it's kind of long. It might might be better over a beer. I don't know. I do wish. I, I do wish. Um, it's a uh, five by four. I think I think we can take ten minutes still. Sure. Okay. I'll, then I'll then I'll then I'll then I'll close it. So so okay. When you've got your your back up to the big slot with the dotted line in the middle and the you know the one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. There we are. Yeah. I used to call that. Yeah. Yeah. So, if I didn't, so this is, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm basically what I'm doing is I want to pose an objection that I know you have answers to, but then I want you to talk about what your two answers are, because I see two ways out. Yeah. So if I were really committed to, um, here, let me, let me make this nice. If I were really committed to the banana, right? then one thing that I could say in response to this is, well, sure, so you put stuff between, like, so now draw another arrow to the banana off the bottom of the diagram, I, right? That's a pretty natural objection. Now, I see two ways for you to respond to that, and you gestured at both of them during the talk. So, I, so what I want you to do is, like, tell me what you think about them and what you think their relative priority is and how you understand them, right? So one thing that you said or that you, that you gestured at more than once, but the sort of stronger current in the talk was, yeah, but down there, there won't be anything that looks like a banana. There won't be a banana down there. There's another thing that you could do that you almost also did a couple of times that I've also heard some, you know, sort of arch Darwinian uh, kind of Arab theorist type people will make this move to, right? And you could just say, yeah, but what matters is that all the stuff in the black letters there just screens off the banana. So maybe sometimes the banana triggers the stuff in black, <coughs> oh. right? But what, it, but what you'll find when you look at the world is that what matters to whether or not I say there's a banana has nothing to do with whether or not there's a banana. It has to do with whether or not my banana system's activated, right? That's what counts. Um, and so in some sense, that we, yeah, maybe there's a banana, maybe there's not a banana, but the story about, the story about me, my utterance of banana is, a lot more about that those that collection of words in black than it is about the external world. Oh, and I wonder what you mean, what you what you because I, I feel like both of those kinds of ideas are sort of floating in the background. And so I wonder what you think about them both. And I just wanted to invite you to say a little bit yeah. more about them. Good. Okay. Very good question or set of questions, which is quite big. Issue. Yeah. That's I guess, that's why I said it was like. Oh, is this a question or is this like a drinking topic? But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So various things. Um, the language. The, so this bit of production here, s or if it's referring to, I just got the sentences here. It does, in its technical sense, express things here which have inputs. Okay, so for the one that is about banana, so on a folk level, so this up here is the representational. Here is, here is pre-representational, no representation here. And secondly, S is definitely not about this. Right, whatever is moving my, my speech now, it just happens in my case. I don't know if you have insight into the inner workings of your speech, but I don't. Right, whatever that... <laughs> Whatever that magnificent system is doing its thing, my talk's not about it. It's about the bananas. 
or about the speech or about whatever. This is like the engine. Okay, <coughs> all, all the action is understanding the engine, as it were, on this view. And that engine, in the case of the banana talk, gets hooked up to, but they're not bananas. As it were, when I encounter banana, sorry, when I say intentionally, oh, look at the banana, as it were, the story that's going to be told about how that works is a non mirror story. It's going to be there's some really interesting theoretical thing going on involving electromagnetic radiation in some field of intensity in a certain region in space, etc., etc. And there's an interesting correlation which you can discover later on. You go, oh, tweak that, that region and you get people reacting in different ways. That relationship between the banana actually in the electromagnetic, or sorry, the field features out there isn't built into the explanation. That's something discovered later. So, um, this isn't about that. It's about whatever folk judgment tells us it's about. And we're just talking about what's in the engine. But what you said, interestingly, I think, is that, well, maybe for this, so, so take causation, right? So one of this is, you know, talk of stuff causing that, you know, this caused that, okay? Striking the match called it, caused it to light or whatever. Uh, it had this pathway ultimately linked to manipulation. Uh, causation isn't here in that position. It's not that your mind latches on to cause. No, it just has kind of, there's a pathway involving manipulations leading to these expressions of that. I, you know, when the kid says, I, ma I, made, I made the cat squeak. <laughs> Right? When the kid grabs the cat's tail and goes, poo, right? its manipulations create something, and it likes that. And that's the beginning of its judgments of causation. Okay. Um, sure, but this whole thing uses causation. So actually, causation is appearing all through here. Right? But you're not, and, and when you tell your story about causal judgments, right, manipulation, you're using causation. But you're not defining causation with causation. There's nothing circular about it. You're using, in other words, causal facts to explain, talk about causation, but not in the sense of trying to define causation by appeal to causation, because it would be circular. Rather, you're saying, what are the systems that underlie judgments of causation? Of course, we tell that story using causation, but we're not defining it. So I don't think it's circular. This is my worry with kind of because if, you, if you're a constructivist, you say, well, uh, so the mind constructs reality, or well, these language systems, as we involve constructing worlds. Uh, yeah, well, but what constructs the mind, as it were? And you could say, oh, well, we've got another, you know, maybe a language system for psychological terms, etc. But still, you've got that whole reality there. Is, its status is problematic, right? So when you apply the theory to itself, to its, its the very systems that it, talk, that it uses to explain things, you get a problem, right? So I think that, I call that a reflexive problem. I, I, I don't think it applies. In other words, we've got causation here, but that's fine. We're not trying to define causation by people causation. Bananas, bananas don't, you talk about bananas, and so the imports here are going to be some interesting features of the world, but not bananas. But bananas might appeal to some, might appear elsewhere. You know, I don't know. I'm not against that. It's just that it won't appeal to in the story of how you get to talk about bananas, which is the core idea, I think. Okay. That's. And as for how we talk about social holes, etc. That's, uh, or even, how do we talk about language, English, for example? Yeah. I have a question of my own. I don't know if I can go a bit longer. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'll have to go. Oh. Sorry. Thank you. Impact. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the aspects of the talk that I have quite an uh, agreement with, and that's something that's explicit in Rorty as well, is that question about fear of knowledge, but I think. They are related to some, in some, at some point to uh, cognitive science and the idea about mind, about mind, and stuff like that. 
And one of the issues I have with uh, constructivism of uh, people like Brogan or uh, Price and all these guys is that in the end, everything uh, is reduced to uh, mental states and it uh, goes never, never beyond mental states, right? And uh, I was wondering how, wh what's your philosophy of mind then? Because the parts about bananas and the uh, stuff seem to be very close, close to with activism and all this kind of philosophy of mind that where the mental states are always uh, for action and they are always involved with uh, matter of actions in a way. And they are not just mental states, right? So I, I was wondering what, what your exact position is uh, regarding philosophy of mind, uh, unloaded mind, and stuff like that, right? Well, <coughs> do you want to go behind the constructivism? What is? Yeah. Um, so, okay. So, so here, I don't know if this is going to help, but <coughs> take meaning. So, one aspect of mental states is well, take meaning and representation. So, me, you know. We use words, they have meanings, they have representational features, and mental states are representational. <clears throat> Is there any theory of representation in the sense of a science of representation is going to be like Fodor used to want to talk about? And the answer is there isn't. Why? Because that's assuming there's going to be some true theoretical identification, like meanings are. Mm representational states are. For example, interesting relations of causal covariation with environmental features or given environmental niches or something like that. I reject that, right? So it's because of the emptiness view, right? So it's a bit like Stephen Stitch. So Stephen Stitch, I believe, used to have the view. He used to say, look, a mature cognitive science isn't going to deal with folks, it's not going to reduce any folks' psychological categories. We're not going to find some theoretical essences of what they are. Mm. Right? So he concludes, so there's no folk psychology, right? <coughs> we, one day we'll replace it all with some future. In fact, Rorty used to think that way in some weird way, right? Right? It's going to be replaced. So it's got, because it has no ultimate, or at least theoretical, or Re um, respectable reduction, it doesn't exist. Okay, I've never, that's the part I reject. So I kind of agree with Stitch that actually when you look at the mechanisms, in no meanings here, buddy, the, where I differ is, I think, so that's what I think the theoretical interest is, but it's not going to be a theory of meaning or representation in the sense that people look for, oh, the inner representations of the brain. There, there aren't, in that sense, theoretically speaking, any in the representations of the brain. But there are representational states. Yeah. In other words, represent representational states are kind of irreducibly folk. It's like we, we talk about the representational. We can give an account of what goes on when I talk <coughs> about you meaning something, me, you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's when they ever go to as it will be able to provide some science of what the subject matter of that talk is. Rather, in other words, our semantics. It's going to be no semantics. Mm. It's just going to be a meta-semantic story of what drives the system. So in that sense, there's no science of mental states. It's the same with the belief state. Like, what is a belief state? We're going to discover what the essence of belief is inside it? No. Uh, but we can give a talk about what goes on when we say, oh, you believe this. Mm. And that's where the action is on this framework. Yes, so, so maybe my question was ill posed, but because it seemed to be very close to uh, ideas of an activism, where the idea is that you're always pre representational, and uh, there is in fact, mental states are not representational, but mental states are actions in a way. They are linked. Yeah, but they want to say mental states are actions. I want to say mental states yes. are representation. <laughs> I want to say they are representation. It's just that we tell the, the action, so the inactivist wants to say, look, there's some interesting feedback systems acting in anticipations of whatever going on here. Fine by me. I just don't think we should therefore say, oh, beliefs aren't really representational. They're kind of anticipations or actions or whatever. I think they confuse levels. 
for me. If you take global expressivism seriously, any more than you should say, oh, uh, moral beliefs are motivational states, that's just like complete confusion. Okay. It's what you express. <laughs> okay, right. I see this. Yeah. I see better. Thank you. Oh. Other questions? No? So we can uh, end up. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.